Hello, welcome to the Thursday, June 9th, 2022 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from San Francisco, California. Today, of course, we had our panel here at RSA. Thanks to everybody attending and thanks to my co-panelists for letting me play again. I want to quickly summarize what we talked about here as well as I can do it uh, within the time allotted here. Katie Nichols talked about living off the cloud attack. That's a concept we covered here a couple times in the recent months when an attacker is using a benign cloud service in order to, for example, exfiltrate data or establish command and control channels. She also talked about the use of multi-factor authentication bypass techniques. Myself, I talked about how backup systems can turn into a risk if they are not patched and configured correctly. Heather Mahalik was uh, talking about some of the risks from stalkerware, including the still present uh, Pegasus tool, which of course uh, goes back uh, to the NSO group and some of the risks involved in the use of uh, these tools, in particular from more advanced adversaries. And finally, we did have uh, Rob Lee talk about some of the attacks against satellite systems back at the end of February as Russia increased its attack on Ukraine. And Rob in particular emphasized how this attack inhibited some of the ability of the Ukrainian military to, for example, connect to artillery systems and efficiently direct its defense in the early days of the war. Also, how then, of course, Starlink was used to restore some of that capability and how Starlink and satellite systems in general are now actually more recognized as a component of uh, military uh, defense and, well, uh, are becoming, of course, more of a target as a result. I'll link uh, to a YouTube stream that RSA published. Now, that YouTube stream includes all the keynotes uh, for Wednesday afternoon, and you have to skip to about the one hour mark in order uh, to listen uh, to our part of the afternoon uh, program. John Pescadori will uh, typically also release a written summary of the keynote, and well, I'll link to it uh, once that becomes available, uh, should typically become available within the next uh, couple days. But let's get back from future threats to what's happening right now. Atlassian Confluence is still sort of a little bit at the top of the news. Yesterday, actually, I forgot to mention it, but I published a quick post on some of the attacks that we are seeing against our honeypots. Our honeypots are not really specific uh, to these type of attacks, but we are still seeing uh, quite a few of scans and exploit attempts uh, coming in. Various bots and such are also exploiting it uh, by now. And one trick that never appears to get old is a fake software that claims to be a copy of commercial software with whatever licensing checks removed. Avast is reporting how search results for CCleaner Pro may be directing you to a fake version of the software. Once you download it and install it, that software will actually inject ads for additional malicious uh, tools. So this fake version is really just used to sort of build a bridgehead on your system and then to continuously advertise more malware for you to download and install. And security researcher Matthias Deek did take a look at the verbatim Keybat secure USB drive. This is one of those uh, secure USB drives that promises encryption and has sort of a built-in keypad in order to unlock uh, the device. Now, typically, these kind of devices are, of course, vulnerable to brute forcing because you only have a numeric keypad and a limited uh, length for uh, the actual pin that you're going to enter. One way how Verbatim promises uh, to mitigate this issue 
is by limiting the number of attempts to 20, which sounds reasonable, but apparently isn't implemented correctly and NetHacker can just try unlimited attempts. Plus, the encryption key being used is actually derived directly from the pin. So there is only a limited number of possible encryption keys, which again does allow for offline attacks when an attacker would essentially just copy the content off the drive and then launch a brute force attack offline. And these are just uh, two of, sort of the more obvious vulnerabilities being found here. A total of four different vulnerabilities are pointed out in the blog post. So certainly wouldn't trust any super sensitive data to this device. Well, and that's it for today. So thanks for listening and talk to you again tomorrow.